This is the Obscurity to Authority podcast with your host, Darren Cabral. And we're live. Vincent Del Monte, thank you so much for joining me, brother. Hey, Darren, thanks for having me, man. Thank you for coming on. This is great. This is a true pleasure. I mean, we were just talking off camera. We share some mutual friends, one of them being Craig Ballantyne, um, one of the best business coaches I've ever worked with. Uh, he also helped you quite a bit too, right? Yes. Craig was uh, – I gave him his nickname. I don't know if you know that, the Godfather. Oh, I heard that story. Yes, yes. said I should have kept it for myself. <laughs> How did that come about? Tell me your version. I heard his version. Well, Craig was one of the very first guys to uh, start – teaching other online i mean we didn't even use the word entrepreneur even in the year 2006 7 8 like the whole world that word entrepreneur just became popular a few years ago um we were just like personal trainers i think you know if i was going across the border i would just call myself a personal trainer i thought of craig as a personal trainer that that was the that was the go-to phrase i was a personal trainer and he was teaching personal trainers how to start online businesses and I went to his uh, very first live event in West Palm, Florida, 2000, and uh, we always mess up the dates. I think it was 2007 or 2008, and it was when I was um, just in the early days, as well as many other big-name characters that many of your listeners would know today. And we were all just trying to figure it out, just, you know, had this idea and um, – Interestingly, way back then, it was still pretty saturated. There were a lot of people doing long-form sales pages, a lot of similar offers and similar niches. And um, Craig had this three-day event, and I still remember I was um, at my desk at Phoenix Fitness. This is when I was working as a fitness consultant, and the email came in, and I wasn't really exposed to like scarcity and first five people who respond get this. Like, it didn't process in my brain that is this actually true or not. Like to me. I had to respond when he said for the next five people that respond, and it in fact was true. But um, you know, I was one of the very first people who signed up for that three-day event. It was a two thousand dollar event. I flew to West Palm, Florida. I had to get the time off work, so I can relate to all the things that people tell me today still. When they're like, ah, Nick, let me know when you come my way, or uh, let me know when you're in my city. I'm like. It doesn't work like that, man. You got to get on these cool things called planes yeah. that can fly you to another place in the world in like hours. What a crazy concept, right? So I went to this event, and at that event, I declared that I was going to be the number one muscle building product on ClickBank. And at the time, I was number two. And uh, after a conversation with one of um, the top internet marketers in the space uh, who gave me one piece of advice, I did achieve that goal, and uh, you know, ever since then, I have always been um, looking up to Craig, not just as um, you know a business mentor, but as um, as somebody who's always I feel has had my best interests at heart, and he's someone who actually knows my family as well. Over the years, he's gotten to know my father and my mom, and he knows my brothers. So for me, finding a mentor, it's very important to find somebody who knows my values, so that when they're giving me advice, it's in context to it's in context of them knowing not just what I want to do, but who I want to be in the process. Does that make sense? hundred percent. So, you know, that's big because, you know, my buddy just got back from a traffic and conversion summit and, you Mm -hmm. know, he's telling me about this new mastermind he joined called war room. And I think it's supposed to be really good, but I don't know anyone in that group. Nobody in that group knows me. And for me, that's kind of um, not a red flag, not something that I couldn't, you know, pursue, but it's really important for me to um, stay plugged into people to have more context to my life. And I think that's something that doesn't get talked about very often. Uh, making money is easy. Growing a brand is easy. Getting attention is easy. The question is how do you do it? Right. How do you get there? And are you proud of what it took and what you gave up to get that end thing, that reward in the end? And uh, I think that's something that I'm pretty passionate about these days. Um, obviously, my faith has a big uh, plays a big role in, in in how I make decisions in that. Even with a faith, it doesn't make things easy. You still are tempted by the same things everybody else is tempted by. And um, 
I think that was one of the reasons I feel like Craig's always had a great head on his shoulders. He's right. very transparent, and Craig's always learning. I know he just joined another mastermind as well, and he's constantly traveling. And uh, he's, like as you uh, suggested, one of the things I really like about him is that um, he's he's very fast. Mm. Like He replies very quickly, but his brain just functions like very sharp, and, and um, it's a gift. He just knows what to tell you. He has a gift of giving you yeah. your next marching orders yeah. without complicating things and just like, no, don't do this. He just seems to always know what to say. And no, Craig's not always right. <laughs> no mentor's <laughs> always right, right? No, no um, it's it's better for you to trust them and be wrong at the start. But like as as time goes on, you do have to start, you know, trusting your own instinct and listening a right. bit more and saying, hey, um, I do like what you're saying, but actually, you know, so. Um, I do the majority of things my coaches tell me. Um, so uh, that's kind of something that comes down the road right. as a coaching relationship evolves. And I think that's in sports too. I think you would find the same thing as the athlete evolves, as the athlete starts to trust his own instincts and intuition and gut. Uh, the relationship becomes even more effective because now it's not just a, a one, a hey, do this, but now you're doing things together. Right. I, I agree with all of that. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff there. But yeah, definitely Craig has always the right thing to say. He's always very quick. He's always very sharp. And I, I, I've i sent him I've sent him emails where I was just venting on things. And I'm like, hey, you don't have to respond to this if you don't want to. I just need to get it off my chest. And I'm like, there's sure. no way he's going to be able to like actually answer this. And sure enough, in two sentences, he'll summarize the whole thing and what to do. And it's just how does he get that level of clarity? But either way, it's very helpful. Um, I could see he helped you a lot. Hopefully, he can continue to do the same with me. Um, and I think it's very important to have those mentors. And it's, uh, you made a great point before, which is everyone wants help. Everyone wants these mentors and coaches, but no one wants to show up. It's like, oh, when you come to me, oh, when it's convenient for me, right? When I met Craig, I didn't text him and say, hey, when you're in town, let's grab coffee. I spent $7,000 to sit in a room for eight hours, right? Uh, oh, cool. And, and it was worth it because now I'm in that circle. I have connection with You did with the him. workshop? We did the full day workshop, yeah. Good for right? you. And so we, we got the connection. We talk. I've got him on my podcast. I've got him involved in other events now. So I've built a, but I, I paid for access and then built yeah, a relationship. Pay to play. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But a lot of people don't want to do that. Anyway, let's roll back to your, I want people to understand kind of your whole deal, as do I. So you've kind of evolved over the years. You started where as a fitness coach, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you the medium length story. Okay. Tell me the whole, from the beginning. I'm not on good here. at anything short. I'm a rambler. So. <laughs> Yeah, I was a high school runner. I grew up in a Christian home. My father was a pastor. I've got two brothers. And uh, yeah, I grew up in that long distance world of um, running, swimming, biking. I represented my country in triathlon. And I found an identity in being very good at endurance sport. I took that into university and I salvaged a nickname that I earned called Skinny Vinny by <laughs> being good at running. I also earned a university degree. Ontario, now known as Western uh, Western University in London, Ontario, an exercise science degree. And that essentially gave me the uh, interest to pursue a career as a high school phys ed teacher, but I didn't make my cutoff. I missed my cutoff by 1%. I struggled to get uh, high 70s in university. I struggled all through high school. Uh, I, I was even in running. That's my story. I've always struggled. I've never been like, I've never excelled at anything in my entire life. Like anything that I've done well, it's come with a lot of work, hmm. and that's just to like make something look maybe slightly, you know, easy if you will. So, school was a grind, running was a grind. Nothing came easy. I was always that mid packer. I lived with all these roommates who were going off to med school and um, were scoring like high nineties, while I swore that I got an eighty and it was a sixty three. <laughs> so, you know, I I was always trying to find something that I was good at. This will all make sense as we hmm. continue the story. And, um, you know, after university, I had to start my career. And my fourth year university, I was working, um, I was doing this like intern thing at a local YMCA. And I fell in love with it. It was the same time I started seeing my running career winding down. And I'm like, what am I going to do after university? And I was also living with all these super buff guys. So, this fascination with building muscle myself was strongly rubbing off on me, and I was eventually able to go, you know, explore that that uh, path. And um, basically, at the end of my uh, university days, 2002, I was 22. 
I started a career as a personal trainer at a local YMCA for $10 an hour. <laughs> and um, that's also when I started my first muscle building transformation under the guidance of a natural bodybuilder in his 40s from my church. <laughs> and he was um, a natural guy. Guy was a beast. And he just basically fit lipped the whole bodybuilding world upside down for me. And to be honest, everything he taught me pretty much became all my marketing for you know, Interesting. the last 15 years because he basically <clears throat> taught me the whole you know minimalistic approach, lower volume, higher intensity, more frequent training per body part, variable rep training, and uh, you know training for different muscle fiber types. Not spending two hours in the gym, not wasting your money on supplements, not spending um, six days a week in the gym with workouts that are for guys who are sticking needles in their rear all day, and <laughs> who you know your workouts that would kill an adult gorilla. And it, so here he is teaching me this. I applied it to my own body, go from skinny Vinny to a buffer version of Vinny, 190. Still not a big guy, but I've got these before and after photos now. Age of 22, life's looking better. Girls that never really paid attention to me all of a sudden are saying hi to me and smiling, especially the cute Italian ones from Italy that were <laughs> hanging out in the city for the summer. Summers were looking better. And, uh, man, life was looking much better with some muscle on your body. Mm. So I told you I'd give you the medium story yeah. version. But um, I eventually uh, realized that the YMCA, <laughs> uh, they're, they're – um, Mission is to give you a job, not um, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, an extensive paycheck of any right, sort. Right. So I took means into my own hands. After I found out I could only get a raise within one year for a whopping one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that was what she told me. I could give mm. you a raise for one dollar in one year from now. I realized that it was my employer's job to give me a paycheck and not to make me rich. Right. So just kind of speed things up a bit. Um, I got exposed to marketing and sales at the next gym I worked at because I worked for a very aggressive salesman. He actually ended up being a con artist, um, huh. go kind of crazy. And um, I learned basically how to sell and more importantly, close. I learned how to keep that freaking door closed until the credit card came out of their back pocket. <laughs> I got really good at it. Um, I loved it. I loved the thrill. I made a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of rooms uncomfortable. I had a lot of people walk out. I had a lot of people cancel their memberships. Um, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just kind of a little naive, just doing what I was told and trying to figure it out along the way. But I actually got kind of good, good, pretty good over time. And um, I started to make a name for myself. And uh, I started to become known as the guy that was really good at selling. And I started to fill the gyms up that I was working at with personal trainers. I was basically writing, if you were a trainer, I'd be writing your paycheck because I'd be filling you up. Yo, bro, here's another guy I just paid – Paid in full, 144 sessions, take care of them. That was my job, to fill you up with clients. I loved it. I loved it. So a couple of years into that, I discovered um, the world of uh, the internet. Uh, the, the two words that changed my life in 2005 were internet marketing. Hmm. Never heard of those words my entire life. Never muttered in my family, in university, amongst my friends. Never read it in a magazine. Didn't know what this world of internet marketing was. And uh, bought these DVDs. Um, and I saw my entire future unfold before my eyes. I said, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. Hmm. I want to sell on the internet. I want to have an online business. I love this whole world of selling information, products, eBooks. And after um, I realized I couldn't do it on my own and uh, getting pitched from the company that sold me these DVDs, they had a follow up, you know, and. They called me on the phone. They said, we have a mentorship program. You'd have a personal coach. It's six months. I got the whole pitch. It was um, it's actually an interesting experience there too. $7,500, six months, one phone call per month, email support. That was it. The huh. mentor that uh, I was assigned, it wasn't like someone I sought out like, hey, man, can you coach me? Never met this guy to this day in my life. Never saw his face. Don't know what he looks like. Um he mentored me for six months and brought my business to life. Wow. And all, all of a sudden, I've got no-nonsense muscle building selling at $77, and that um, you know, over four years became a seven-figure brand. But way before that, um, it took weeks before I sold my first copy, and um, the first copy was sold to two people I knew, one of them who uh, brought me into this world. Wow, that's interesting. 
So you dived right, so you made the decision there getting into internet marketing and in a very short span you went right into getting a coach and a mentor and paying for that advice. Yeah. Wow. It's never um for me, but you know what, let me give you a bit more context. First of all, I grew up as a runner with coaches. Mm. My father's a pastor. So I've always been in a world of like you know, learn. I my father was a reader. Like if you just look at my the back here, I'm like this is my bookshelf. Yeah, nice. I'd be fooling you if I said I've read every book back here, but uh, <laughs> I've been exposed to books. Yeah. You know, I'd go to the movies with my father, and he'd bring a bag. I'm like, Dad, what's in the bag? He'd have ten books. I'm like, Why do you have ten books when we go to the movies? You know, just in case. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> the previews are too long. My Amazing. dad was always carrying books. Yeah. And uh, so my brothers and I were exposed to that. I think is one of the best gifts him and my mom gave us. Wow. And um, yeah, with the coach. Um, you know, I was a runner, so I had coaches through university, through high school, so it always made sense to me. Um, what was interesting, though, was um, I'd already tried a couple internet marketing ventures by myself, right? And they failed. Yeah. Uh, and I was kind of getting a reputation at the same time as like Vince is like always looking for the next red shiny object, mm. and um, and so this internet marketing thing was kind of like my last card in my mind. So I'm like, if this doesn't work out. What's the worst thing that can happen? I work at Phoenix Fitness the rest of my life in Hamilton, Ontario. I make $74,000 a year. What's so bad about that? I'm a personal trainer. I work Monday to Friday, split shifts, weekends off. I help people achieve their physical. What's wrong with that? That's like a great life. I'm like, to my, in my mind, I'm like, it can't get worse. It can only get better. Right. So why not go for it? What's the worst thing? I honestly just like, and I don't know. I don't understand why people are so attached to money. Hmm. I, I really does. It makes zero sense to me. I'm like, my coaching program is nineteen thousand dollars if you pay for the year in full, or nineteen hundred dollars a month. So you're telling me if you gave me nineteen thousand dollars, and you didn't even get a single thing from it, you wouldn't recover. Of course they would. Of course you would. Nineteen thousand dollars would devastate your life. And I think, you know, I love what Anthony Robbins talks about, you know, you got to get excited about what could happen and what likely will not happen. Right, right. <laughs> you know, you got to start thinking about what this investment could cause and yeah. not what it's going to cost. It, it just, it, it blows my mind how attached people are to money and, and most people don't even have much of it anyways. So it's like, it can't get that much tighter. It's already tight. Right, 100%. So, again, this isn't a tactic, by the way. I'm not yeah, trying to like... Yeah. If anyone's like on the fence, this is the God's honest truth, and that's the that's the way my mind processed yeah. this whole thing back in 2005. I'm like, okay, I put it on two credit cards. If it doesn't work out, what's the worst thing that can happen? I work some extra hours right. at the gym and pay it off. Right. My See, gosh, but if it does work out, if it does work out, and I and I actually told the uh, guy that was pitching me on the phone, I said, hey man. So he says, are we doing this or what? Are we moving forward? Where would you like to go from here? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I thought I had him. I'm like, I will give you my money. Thinking that like, you know, he needed me, right? Like he needs my money. This is a salesman. A salesman yeah. needs my money. Yeah. And, right? He's a, that's, and I'm like, I've got this guy. He needs my money. I'll tell you what. You guarantee me that I'm going to be making three to $4,000 a month by the end of this and I will sign up. Yeah. That was like my big thing. I was like, I'm going to throw it back on him. Yeah. See what he says now. Let's see if he really thinks he's good. And he laughed at me. Yeah. I, so what? What do you laugh? What? What do you? What are you laughing at? That you don't? You, we're not doing this or what? He goes, dude. I'm guaranteeing my time, but I don't know what you're doing with yours. Ooh, There's no guarantees, one. brother. There's no guarantees. And that was my first exposure to the concept of success is your responsibility. Mm. And, you know, Jocko Willenick has made this famous with his book, Extreme Ownership. But that was my first really real introduction to everything is because of you. You know, the good stuff and the bad yeah. stuff. So he's like, I'm not taking your money. You're not investing into me. You're investing into yourself. Again, 25 years old. Remember, I'm 25 years old. This is before I've been exposed to Grant Cardone and everybody yeah, yeah. else. I'm like, huh, those are really good points. Those are 
And then I was like, all right, let's do it. So I had to actually scramble two credit cards together. Yeah. Yep. I had to get resourceful. I had to figure that out. And I like had to, I so, which actually was interesting. I just wrap up this whole thing here. Mm-hmm. Many, many years later, actually this past year, I was at a Grant Cardone event and he was yelling at the audience and he goes, it doesn't take money to make money. It takes courage and it takes guts. And I almost wanted to stand up and applause because I was like, that was me. Like yeah. I didn't know that back then, but it took courage to call the credit card company and ask him for a second card and to figure out um, how to – Go out on a limb and live tight and be resourceful and have faith. <clears throat> yeah. And have faith. You know, I don't think you know everybody. We live in a culture that uh, you know worships and like bows down to like they need certainty, they need yeah. facts, they yeah. need guarantees. Everybody wants to know, but then what's the point of the journey if you know what's going to happen? Yeah. Why even go on the journey if you know what's going to happen in the in the? It kind of defeats the, pro- the 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 purpose of the of the development that right. occurs along the way. So, you know, we don't have a guarantee in our coaching program. I took that from way back then, and uh, and I think I just people need to start asking themselves: Do I really want to do this? Because there's no shortage of money on this planet. There's only a shortage of people going after it, right? right? And the only reason someone will not invest in themselves is it does not have to do with the money, even if their bank account reads zero. Where other people would say that's actually a condition. No, it's it's a condition of the mind. All right. And because if they truly believe it's going to work, they'll go find the money. They can, they could, you could drive Uber a couple shifts a month to cover me and I could help you build something right. six, six, ten times bigger than what you're currently doing, right? Or you're somebody else. You don't need to hire, you can hire anybody, right? So it really comes down to you believe it's going to work. And that's where, like, if you look at my marketing, if you look how I, you know, market and sell, it's always based around social proof. Because I know you, I don't need to sell you on coaching. You're just trying to figure out if I'm your guy and if this process we have will actually work for you. So my job is just to shove as much of shove as much social proof down your throat until you choke. Yeah. And you're like, okay, yep. fine, let's do it. You got me. I'll give you let's do this for a year. I, I have to do this. Like you have to overwhelm them with conviction that yep. all they need to do is make the decision and then we rock and roll. So you know that's where my mindset's at, um, and t- just to bring Craig back into this conversation, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Craig taught me this with my fitness business, like in the early, early days, like before 2010. I remember, I still remember, an email he sent me, and essentially it basically said, "Vinny, people believe that you can build muscle, and your customers can build muscle. They don't believe they can build muscle. Mm-hmm. Everything you do has to increase their own belief that they can do it." And he said, "Just um, double down on featuring." Um, just more and more and more success stories. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, we're, we're in that that time. A hundred percent. And everybody needs that. That's the market we're in. Like we even get it now. So I have a social media marketing agency. We work with more. So the local brands, some national brands, uh, really taking them online. We manage all the parts of their social, their creative media, their advertising, all these pieces. Right. And even we get on sales calls and these large businesses want guarantees of marketing. Like we'll hire you as an agency, but you need to guarantee we're going to make this much money. And it's like, well, unless I can control every part of your business as a marketer, I can't control the complete outcome. We can do everything right on our end, but you drop the ball. You don't follow up. You don't make the calls. Your sales team sucks. You guys don't sell unless I own the whole company and run it. I can't guarantee. But we get at least once a week someone saying, you know, this is a lot of money. The retainers are three to five grand a month. Is there a guarantee that I'm going to make five grand back by next month? <laughs> and I go, if any marketing company has a magic button, they say, yeah, 100%. You give us five, we give you 10 back next month, 100% guarantee. They'd be a multi billion dollar company many times over. It's just not possible. Marketing is one part of a successful business, there's a lot of other pieces. Um, so yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. And I'm sure in, in the health and fitness industry, it's even more so, right? Especially because there's so many people who are selling false information. There are a lot of people who aren't really in others' best interest like you are. And people probably have been burned or they heard of people that have been burned and they need the certainty, but most of all in themselves, they don't believe in themselves. And once they believe that they can actually do it and you can show them that, I think they pull the trigger. But going back, the the biggest thing for me is like our podcast is called Obscurity to Authority. So I love trying to map out how people go from obscurity to authority. You obviously, like you said, were in obscurity. You worked at a, at a gym. 
Um, you were getting paid whatever it was, 10 bucks an hour, I think you were saying. And you had a realization. That was your first step to success because that's where a lot of people start. But you had this, this high level of self-awareness because I think a lot of people are in that situation but aren't really aware that, oh, my company's job is to give me a paycheck, not to make me super wealthy, right? That, that's my responsibility. If I want to be rich, if I want to make money, it's my call. And you figure that out. You made a decision. You took action. But the other important thing you did, which I think highlights this perfect path to your success, was sales. You got into sales and you learned how to sell, right? So first you had the self-awareness to kind of make the decision, and then you learned how to sell. And that's one of the best, like anyone I could give advice to, this could just be me, but when I have younger people ask me what they should do, the first job I always suggest is sales. Get into retail sales, sell something in a building face-to-face and do that for a couple years. Because I that, agree with that. 100%, right? Yeah, no, 100%, man. A uh, couple of books. People need to get plugged into sell or be sold. It's a great one. Closer survival guide. Yep. It, it really is a mindset. You know, every every um, interaction is there's a sale. There's a transaction be made. Yeah. Uh, somebody's being sold and somebody's buying. Somebody's selling. Somebody's buying. So um, it's a way of life. I mean, I mean, relationships, uh, parenting, <laughs> marriage, yep. business, everything, everything. Every conversation you have. Yeah. So I mean, I could go down the rabbit hole for quite a while on sales, but um. <laughs> But, you know, it, it really, you know, I, I love um, just the simplicity of business in terms of just that conversation right there. You know, yeah. it, it really just comes down to, um, it really just comes down to finding out, like, where they're at, where they want to go and, and figuring out if there's a, a gap. And one of the big things that we've really doubled down on our on our conversations, you know, for people selling, listening, is you can't be afraid of asking hard questions. Right. The value of hard questions, and the value of and, and um, the value of getting people really focused on the cost of what will happen if they don't do this. Right. Does that make sense? So, well, yeah. so not that not that the actual carrot. Right. But but what they will lose. All yes. right. What will hap- Like what will the path look like if you don't do this? I just I was at a big event. Um, I went to Elevation Church this past weekend in Ballantyne, the fastest growing church in the world, and. Uh, you know, I talked with a lot of um, pastors who mentor men, uh, many men in their 50s and 60s. And um, I, you know, asked them, what are some of the things that these men struggle with? And it was just absolutely mind blowing. Um, do you mind if I just crack open an email? And can you still see me if I open up my email? We keep yeah, talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me just, uh, this is going to actually blow you guys away. And, um, you know, I wanted just to kind of get an idea of like what are these what are these men struggling with? What's a common thing? And this isn't just uh, m- uh, men in the church world. And um, here's a couple of like the big common themes, and I think a lot of people listening can really relate to this. Yeah. Um, a lot of guys, I'm going to just kind of go through right now the different stages of life. Sure. Uh, for men in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and I and I want to really paint a picture of the cost of not acting today. So I think a lot, I'll start with the men in their 20s and 30s. I think most men in the in this age range, they, they understand the value of mentorship. Like it's not like as not mainstream as mainstream. It's becoming more popular. And most men are looking for uh, a coach, maybe in fitness, with marriage, and man, in, in business. And um, most men are trying to figure out their purpose amongst a lot of busyness, you know, new career, school, maybe they just got married, maybe mm-hmm. they just had their first kid. Life's freaking crazy, all right? And um, I love what John Maxwell says, most men are just accepting their life and they aren't living it. And I think in their 20s and 30s, most men are trying to figure out how to live a life. Mm-hmm. Now, the big problem with men in their 20s and 30s uh, that I see is that they've got uphill dreams, but they've got downhill habits. Right. All right. And uh, most men are trying to establish their routine. Um, Some of them are getting into marriages and starting to realize these are far more challenging than they ever imagined. And a lot of bad habits from their single days or maybe a lot of um, inner work that they didn't do is now starting to get exposed in the relationship. Hmm. And now maybe with young kids. And this is starting to create a lot of stress, which is preventing men from being intentional about making a move. Mm. 
mm. about taking a risk, about seizing an opportunity, and their job is starting to become more and more comfortable. And the idea of like leaving that job is like, I can't even fathom starting something completely new with all this other stuff. All right. So, so I find, does that sound, I'll pause right there. I know that was a lot. Can you relate yeah. to any of that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. We see it all the time. So, so what happens now, if men don't start getting attentional in their twenties and thirties with living their life as opposed to accepting their life, this relationship in, uh, their marriage starts to, uh, create cracks. They start feeling lost. Um, they start wondering, um, maybe, uh, my career wasn't all it was meant to be. And they start wondering, now what? Now what? And they start going through what we call a midlife crisis, right? They right. start wondering, is this all there is? Did I miss my calling? Is it too late to start something else? Uh, most men start, you know, using pornography way mm -hmm. more than they ever thought just to feel better. So now you're in your forties and you're, you know, Things are, and then you've got young kids, and you've got the responsibilities of young kids, and now the young kids are starting to develop minds of their own. And um, if you haven't started developing the habits and pursuing your path in your 20s, 30s, this stuff doesn't get better. It even gets right, just keeps getting worse, and, right. and 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 it gets even worse in the 50s and 60s. You know, yeah. now in your you're in your 50s, and I listen to some of these old guys in the gym, and what are they talking about in the change room? They're excited about their next home renovation. They're excited about maybe getting a week off this year and going on a vacation. And uh, they're really confused on, you know, what they're supposed to do with their life and if it's even, you know, too late. And um, a lot of these men now in their 50s and 60s, they feel inadequate to seek mentorship from somebody younger, from right. a generation uh, or two underneath them and you know they're really at that point now in their life in their 50s and 60s feeling like man i've just wasted my talents i've been given these yeah. talents i use them to big build maybe an investment portfolio i don't know like what this is what my life has uh accumulated to an investment portfolio um maybe with church they're hardly involved anymore they've got no more edge to them they're sad they're frustrated and uh it's too late. Hmm. You know, you, you can always say there's, there's never too late, but come on, let's be honest. By the time you're in your fifties and sixties, like it, it, you, there's, there's a consequence. And I think one of the things I want people to listen to right now is there's a consequence to not taking action. All right. So you're like, well, what if it doesn't work out? Well, if it, if, if it doesn't work out, you might lose some time and money. But if you don't pursue this right. and you stay where you're at, the consequence is at the end of your life, you're going to look back. And there's a great, um, great little story from uh, Denzel Washington shared this in one of his talks. It was from Les Brown, and he, and uh, essentially said that at your deathbed, you're gonna have a ton of ghosts approach you, and each of these ghosts are your idea ghosts, and they're all the ideas that came to you over the course of your lifetime, and they're gonna ask you while you're on your deathbed, why are we dying together? Why? didn't we do something when we hmm. brought this idea to you when you were 22 when you were 31 why do we all have to die now and i just want to encourage everyone listening to not visit your deathbed with a ton of idea ghosts interesting that that is that's very deep i've never heard that one but i can totally relate to that because i always say something nowhere near that profound but i always explain that i optimize for minimal regret. So I always think of when I'm on my deathbed, what would I possibly regret? So if I'm making a decision right now, I think about it in the sense of if I'm sitting here, I'm 75, 85, 95, whatever it is, looking back at this, am I going to say, oh, I'm really glad I didn't do that and spend $7,000. I saved seven grand. Or am I going to say, shit, I should have done that thing and tried it. And who cares? 40, 50 years from now, that seven grand is not even relevant. It doesn't even exist. You know, but the thought yeah. and the regret of the path missed that you could have taken will definitely weigh heavy. And so I've, I've always thought of that. And I think that that is a very critical age, that 50, 60 mark. Um, even personally in, in, in family, like extended family, I've seen a lot of crumbling lately. A lot of the men in, in you know, my extended family are hitting that 50, 60 mark. And, and man, like the self implosion that is going on, like this, the changing of the personality, some of them are just 
waking up and distancing from their families. They want to party again. They want to get out. They want to excite because they're missing something. I think they're waking up and realizing something's not there. Something's been wasted and that now finally time is, is finite, right? Which is something I think if we realized earlier on, we'd have much more enjoyable lives. Like that's something I try to remind myself. Like I'm very, it sounds really weird. I'm very aware of death and it sounds like odd, but I'm very aware there's an, there's an end. Like I have a limited time at this moment to make the most of this particular life in this window, right? I don't want to just squander it, waste it. Hey, let me save a thousand dollars. You're not going to be happier because of that. So I try to do everything I can spend what I can have as much impact as possible. Interview great people like you and learn from you guys. Um, because I don't want to regret it. I don't want to get to 50 and, and look back and go shit. I wasted 50 years. That's great, man. Yeah, so that that's profound. Like, I, I'm glad, I'm glad we're aligned because I think the exact same thing, and I think a lot of people need to hear that. Hmm. Good stuff, man. So let's let let's chat a bit. I mean, the first two things, because again, going back to your path and your success, because I think just by modeling you, there's a lot of value. If someone can look at the path you took, you made critical decisions, and we mentioned the first one, um, the second one, but the biggest one to me was the coaching part. So many people will start that bit like they, they have the first part. They go, hey, I, I want more money. I want to get in my job and, and they go do something. They learn sales. Great. Then they go start a business, but they never get help. They never get coaches. They never get mentors or they're too skeptical or they're always say, oh, I'll do it next year or the year after or the year after. What really helped you make that decision so quickly? Was it just because you were always surrounded by coaches and you understood the value or was there something else that you knew why you had to do that? Yeah, I mean – it really comes down to not knowing where you want to go, but knowing why you can't stay where you are mm. and, and knowing the cost. Like I was saying, knowing the cost of staying where you're at. So, Hey, and, and just to be able to look at it as, Hey, worst case scenario, I stay here, but this is, is this really where I want to be in five years? Do I want to be 35 and still a personal trainer? Right. Do I want to be 60 years old and, still teaching guys how to do the leg extension mm. and, and not, you know what I'm saying? And, and nothing wrong with that, but like, I feel like you need to be writing some new chapters. Like how, how, how many years are you going to write that chapter? You've got to grow. And, and if somebody's feeling like, well, what's wrong with that, Vince? Well, you got to answer that yourself. I personally think that, that I personally feel like you haven't continued to grow. Like why not, you know, teach more trainers how to do that. Right. Um, and most people just want to stay where they're familiar, right? And, you know, that's that's really what it comes down to. How much do you value growth? Because growth happens outside of the familiar. And it requires faith. And it requires you stepping out on your maybe. And on your, on the perhaps this might happen. Yeah. But it really just comes down to going for it. And then also looking around you. And I was doing a bit of research at the time as well, add a little more to the story. And the individuals that I was looking at, I found out, like one guy that I was looking at, I saw his sales page. I found out that he was working with another coach who wrote it for him and was guiding him. So I'm like, what is this guy? What's this guy t telling him? Like, I need an advantage. It's like, how are you going to compete when, you know, your competition has a, a, a leg up? And they've got more skills than you. So, like, you got to do something to level the playing field, right? How are you going to compete? If you're going to go in a business, if you're going to step on into the ring, if you're going to do a show, how are you going to level the playing field? You got to buy knowledge. Right. And, and you got to buy accountability. Mm -hmm. And you got to buy outcome. You got to buy something that's going to force the growth. And you've got to put some blood in the game because if there's not, there's yeah. no game. Yeah. And, and two things to add on that. I think the sole function of, of like what you did, for example, of taking two credit cards, you said to pay for that coaching, you put yourself into a corner that you had to get out of. It was a commitment. There was nothing that was going to sway you. Now you're, you're so deep into that, that you're going to make it work. Now you're going to stay up late. You're going to do the work. You're going to put in the time because you have no other option. I mean, there's other options, but the point is still, and I like that. Like I do the same thing. Like I'll purchase stuff well above, like if it's coaching or, or new software or even hiring new team members when we hire new employees, um, I always do it ahead of the curve because it forces me to figure it out, which is a little risky, but it helps because sometimes you just need that commitment. I can't go home and question it at night. Oh, should I? It, too late. It's done. <laughs> figure it out, right? And sometimes that's the biggest part. But another note on it is, do you know um, Billy Jean is marketing? Do you know that guy? Yeah, yeah. He's coming to speak to us. Um 
at the Empire Mastermind in May. Oh, cool. Yeah, I know, I know, I know Billy Jean, of course. Nice. So I, I love him, and he said something the other day on uh, on a video, which was, you know, common sense. If you want to get from, you know, downtown Toronto to somewhere in Muskoka, you want to get right by the waterfront. The first thing you're going to do if I say, hey, get from Toronto to somewhere in Muskoka, you're going to pull out your map, you're going to Google the address, and you're going to follow the map that someone had laid out to get there. That's common sense. You wouldn't yeah. get in your car and just turn it on and drive and wonder where Muskoka is. And it's like, that's very true. It's the same thing in business. You know you want to get to a certain point of success, and you're basically just turning on the car and driving when you could just go ask somebody the route and take their advice and follow the directions. right? So it really can be very, very simple, but I think... People overthink it or they don't want to commit, but either way, you did it. And I think that's a huge part of success is making that commitment in other people, putting up the money, taking the plunge, biting the bullet, um, and trusting others to support you that have done it, that are ahead of you. Yeah, man. I can't agree more. Very cool. So I want to talk in our last little bit. I want to kind of chat a little bit about marketing because you you are definitely a marketing guy. Um, I see your stuff. I follow the content. You know what you're doing. So how hang on hang on what what do you like <laughs> let's have a conversation what what do you I like? like hey i want to put you i want to put yeah. you on the we're going to put yeah. darren on the spot here because uh, i know we're live here yeah. let's keep this interesting yeah. i want to hear one thing you like about my marketing and yeah. one thing you don't like i like the content i like that you you have great salesmanship you have I don't know if it's copy. I don't know if it's like writing scripts for your videos before you do all of them, but at least you understand the principles of copy so well that when you speak, it's very impactful. You hit all the right notes. You kind of pull all the right strings, turn all the right keys. Um, I think that's very powerful. And I see the launches you do, certain product launches, the funnels. There's a lot of power behind that, and you really understand the full kind of capacity of the digital world, and you're using it. Where did you learn all that from? I've been doing it since 2006. My my um, core group of friends, so at my wedding, I got married in 2010, there was a table of uh, about, I think, 10 to 12 guys, and they were all multi-seven-figure earners. Wow. We all started together, and now they're like way bigger, way bigger. Um, and we were all hardcore direct response marketers, mm. you know, in, internet marketers, split testers, you know, buy traffic affiliate promotions like we come from the old school optimizing sales pages optimizing upsell funnels you know that's one of the cool things when you come into our coaching program man, we go old school on a lot of stuff and it's because it still works you know there's a reason call center still exists right right you go, oh, there's a reason long form sales pages still exist those pages are so hypey and so long well they're not dead they still work yeah, yeah. they make a lot of money yeah and they get a lot of people to take action so we use a lot of that stuff still. And obviously the way it looks is a little different. You know, pages right. might look a little more modern, more graphic heavy, uh, not as much copy depending on the market and the offer and the status of the uh, publisher, if they're a celebrity or a no one. A lot of variables go- that go into this, right? And we have some clients that don't need as much text because um, they're well-known. Mm. They already have well-established brands. Um you know, a celebrity doesn't need a 96-page letter to sell a $10 ebook. You know what I mean? But um, maybe somebody who's completely new, nobody's ever heard of them. Well, we know that that person is going to need more copy. So we might have a new coaching member, a girl that's like, "Oh my gosh, there's no, this is way too much. This is not. I can't." And it, and she doesn't understand. Like, yeah, but nobody knows who you are. Right. You're a complete nobody. How are you planning on selling the same way as Jennifer Aniston, Jennifer Lopez? Like. The whole world knows who they are. You can't have a sales page or a website that looks like, uh, oh, what's the girl, Jessica Elba. Like, she's famous. <laughs> yeah. Like, they're, yeah. Oh, I don't want that to, well, so you have to sometimes just understand certain things work based on who you are and where you're at. Right. And, and marketing can evolve. Like, mm. my marketing was much hypier um, in my earlier days. Um, I would say my fitness stuff was pretty, you know, hypier and noisier and uh, over the top and aggressive, but I just knew who I was competing with. Like, how am I supposed to compete with Jeremy Buinda? How am I mm. supposed to compete with all these steroid users? Mm. You like, if I'm in the skinny guy market, I'm a natural guy. How am I supposed to compete with all these steroid users? They don't need long form sales copy because they look like Greek sculptures. <laughs> So if yeah. I'm not taking steroids, mm. if I'm not cheating, then I need to 
give myself an advantage. So my advantage is under looking at the tools I have available. And um, if I'm not shredded all year round and I'm not buff all year round, I had to – I resorted to long-form sales copy. Yeah. I resorted to marketing. I had to use tools that could <laughs> help establish my brand. I was, I was aware – that if I was just bigger and leaner, I probably wouldn't need as many words. But I, I'm, I look in the mirror. I'm like, I look good, but I'm not, I'm not those guys. Right. So I think there's a self awareness piece to to your marketing as well. Mm. And then I'll also say now, like if you look at our marketing for my fitness stuff, I don't say as much, or for my business stuff because um, there's a confidence that comes as you grow. That requires you to say less words. So one of my things, like if you watch my coach, Bedros, when he pitches his mentorship program, he does a 15-second story because he's Bedros. Yeah, exactly. He's a, he's a celebrity. Yeah. If Bedros says there's a mentorship, like you just you, – he, he doesn't need to sell something for a two-minute story because he's a celebrity. I am aware – that I might not be perceived yet of that same caliber. I could be a limiting belief as well. Mm-hmm. My stories, if you watch them, are longer because I just feel like I need to still right. say more because I'm aware of my prospects' options and I want to make sure that I overcome a right. lot of the objections they might have in their mind. And that just requires more words. Right. That requires a longer conversation. Now, what you will find, and I will say that I have a lot to be thankful for because of my brother, Michael, is because he's a filmmaker and his, he's scaled at hacking fluff and redundancy and helping you just get to the point. Our marketing is getting much more concise. I would say uh, go watch my Instagram videos. I feel like we do – we give substance in every one of my videos now, every one of my posts. Every word matters, and that's really – where I feel every marketer wants to evolve to, to a point where they've elevated their prestige so much that they don't need to say a lot because mm-hmm. people trust them, they like them, they know them, they've got the track record. But when you're starting out and you don't have that, you just have to realize that you might have to be a little more aggressive you know, for a while before you get to that point where you're a household name <clears throat> and – you know. You can just say, hey, here's our new offer. Go here, buy, right. and people don't need the pitch. But unfortunately, most people are not there yet. So mm. I think if you look at my marketing, I think one of the big things was self-awareness of who I was and what I needed to do to make the sale, or what I needed to do to close the deal. And um, I, I'm proud of like what we're really putting out right now. I'm really proud of what we've put out the last few years with my fitness stuff, primarily my business stuff because um, – I have the track record. If you go to a YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, you'll find um, a ton of stories of students who are crushing it. And I'm hardly in the video. I do a little intro, outro. But you can uh, – now I'm letting my students do the talking for me. And that's a, that's where I've always wanted my brand to go and that's where it's getting. I want my students to do the talking for me. I've already displayed my selling power. I want to display my coaching power now. Beautiful. I love it. So I'm going to ask you one more question uh, before you leave on a marketing note. If it could be specific to the fitness industry, it could be for any business that's trying to actually market online and sell online. They're getting started. They've never touched this before. They don't have the credibility online. There's a lot of options for them, as you know. They can go the organic route. Do they try just building their brand, their Instagram, their content? They can go the paid route. They can go both. What would be your one piece of advice? What's the one thing you would advise them to do if I say, hey, I want to get into internet marketing. I want to sell online. I want to sell for my business. What's the first thing I should be focusing on doing? Can I give you five? Sure. (laughs) It's under um, one title. It's called the five ones. Mm. You need to get clarity on your one audience. Your one program, your one conversion tool, interesting. Your one, your one traffic source, and you need one year. Interesting. All on that. So complete singularity of focus. So let me give you an example. My seven-figure mastermind. All right, is my one product. My one audience are online fitness experts who want to hit their first six figures or first seven figures. My one conversion tool, phone. My one traffic source, Instagram. 
Wow. One year, we've built our recurring revenue up to um, over almost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a month. Wow, that's incredible. With that one, with that one strategy. That's nothing else. DM. Wow. And all from Instagram traffic. Are you buying? Is it paid traffic or all, all organic? We do a lot of paid traffic. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We spend. You know, not, I, I'm not crazy. I don't mind sharing numbers just yeah. because. You know, we we it's. I don't. Some people. This might sound like a lot to many people. Like. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. It's going to sound like chump change. Um. I mean, last year I, we spent over half a million dollars on. Wow, um, that's quite a bit. On advertising, uh, just promoting the Vince Del Monte Seven Figure Mastermind. I mean, when you see the videos and those rooms are full. The majority of those members are attendees are my coaching students. Wow, they're invested in the coaching program, getting results, running their own race. They're committed for the year, and they're coming to events every ninety days. And then we let Amazing. people sit in on the event to test drive it. I'm a big believer to uh, try before you buy. I have no problem with that. Uh, although my you know my mentor didn't offer that to me. We're now we're, that was back in 2006. You know I feel now. Um, we don't have a money back guarantee, but we let you come and test drive the mastermind right. for a no brainer fee. And you can decide that weekend if you want to join because, hey, I understand there's, there are coaches. There's a lot of good coaches out there. All right. There are legit, there are a lot of, let's not talk about the bad coaches. Let's talk about sure. the good coaches. There are a lot of great coaching yep. programs you can join. Yep. There's a lot of good people. All right. Not everybody's trying to scam you. No. There's some incredible people who've got incredible networks, who've got incredible skills, who will hold you accountable. They want to see you successful. Yes, they're number driven, but they care about you. There are a lot of good people out there, and I understand some people just want to kind of find their home. They want to, they you know, they want to kind of do a little test drive. Now, what I say, people, you know, I say a test drive is, you know, for a couple hours, right? <laughs> so you come experience the weekend, right. and then you decide that night. Right. And if yeah, not for Smart. us, we don't let you come. We don't let you test drive it again. All right. If you don't join that weekend, you can't join the group. It's like, why in the world did you come here if you're not going to pursue this? It makes no sense. Like, I'm almost just helping you. Like, say this is not for you. No one's going to tell you that. Right. But you came, so you flew a plane. You didn't fly a plane. You got in a plane. <laughs> Maybe. You booked a hotel. You left your family. Yeah. You sat in a room. You learned. You got a ton of value and you're not joining? Crazy. Now, some people will say I'm not joining because I want to stick to the path I've, uh, I'm already on and, and I don't want to go in this direction of the online. And by that's awesome. You basically spent a, a small amount of money to discover that. It's like paying a couple hundred dollars on dinner dates with a girl to finally realize you don't want to keep dating her. That wasn't an expense. That mm. was a good investment. Yeah. You spent four hundred dollars on dinner dates to know not to spend another four thousand yeah. dollars on her, all right, <laughs> and to go to Las Vegas with her. And yeah. You know what I'm saying? So this wasn't an expense. This was actually good. And they're like, "Yeah, no, it's good. I'm glad I came. I now know I don't want to do this." Some people say, "I had no idea there's this much that goes into an online business." Mm. I thought this was a kind of something easy. They're like, <laughs> "I'm sticking to my job." Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. "I'm glad you figured that Perfect. out this weekend." I'm so happy you. <laughs> figured that out this weekend and all the best i wish you the you know greatest luck in the future nice i love that man hey well before i let you go where can people find you instagram <laughs> <laughs> what's the instagram. handle yeah let's keep it simple i uh, just as a little thing mm. uh even if there are more places to find me, I'm only going to give you one because nobody's yeah. going to go look three, four, five places. So right. let's just keep it simple for everybody. Vince Del Monte on Instagram. Perfect. And the program, the one program is your seven-figure mastermind. Yeah. Vince Del Monte, seven-figure mastermind.com. And the seven is the number seven. And uh, that's a page that's an application for our next event, by the way, in Vancouver, where you can apply to come and sit in, test drive the group. It's going to be awesome. And uh, yeah, we got to get you out to one of the, the events, Darren. We're going to be in um, Toronto in August and November cool. as well, but uh, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll chat later. Yeah, man, let's do it. All right, thank you so much, Vince, for coming out. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed the chat. I'm sure a lot of other people did and will uh, enjoy it as well. Tons of value. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. All right. You've been listening to the Obscurity to Authority podcast. Tune in again next week with your host, Darren Cabral, as he explores the blueprint of success.